Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, who's excited to be here today? Woo! <laughs> right? I mean, it's just so inspirational to see this amazing gathering of women. And not just here, I mean, this is being live streamed across the globe, right? So, and seeing all these wonderful efforts, I think, you know, just gives me so much energy, hope, and motivation for the future. Uh, if you followed me or others like Timnet, you know, over the last few years, especially, there has been a big push towards you know, truly asking how we can improve diversity and inclusivity in actionable ways, right? And that means uh, in addition to the positive efforts, we also need to look at what are the barriers and what are truly problematic things that need to be stopped in our community. And so thanks to all of you, I know so many of you have participated in that. And uh, uh, New Rip's name change from NIPS was only the first step. So if you followed that, you know, I think that's a great first step and it brought out a lot of important issues that I'm sure all of you have faced or still facing in many ways, right? Including the men. I mean, so many men came up to me and told me uh, the issues they had faced and they could never even talk about it, like bullying, harassment. And so all this affects us in many different ways. And to me, just having that community come together uh, is amazing, and I hope we can continue to do that. And that's where I'm very inspired by so many machine learning researchers here today. Like, as we are pushing the field forward, so many people here are also looking at uh, societal impact, fairness, ethics. Uh, this is just so critical as machine learning is taking off. And so it's deeply inspirational to be here. So today I'll talk about uh, you know, how I think of uh, where machine learning is uh, headed and where it's been in the last few years. You know, what created this deep learning revolution and how do we take it to the next level, right? What are still some uh, shortcomings and open research problems that can uh, you know, truly help AI make a big impact in the real world? And so I broadly named it as exploiting structure in machine learning, right? Like what does structure mean? It can mean some domain knowledge that experts can provide. It can mean uh, some underlying, um, um, you know, uh, low dimensional uh, structure that by explicitly exploiting that you can do with less data, you can potentially do with less computational requirements and get good accuracy, good generalization. So we'll see how we can go about doing that in some examples. But before that, when I think about um, AI and ML, right, there are three main ingredients uh, that we need to keep in mind, especially when we you know, look at, towards doing this in the real world. Right, so most of the time as researchers, we are focusing on uh, just the algorithms, right? Like how do we make these algorithms efficient? How do we come up with new algorithms? But most of the time, the other two ingredients are, you know, if not as important, probably even more important, right? So in so many applications, data is the big barrier. You know, uh, there was the talk on healthcare. I mean, data is like uh, uh, such a big issue. How do we get enough data of good quality and at the same time deal with issues like privacy and data bias and so on. So focusing on the data is where I think the field needs to do when we take it to the next level now. And the other is the compute. Uh, you know, there in many parts of the world, uh, uh, computational resources are still a big barrier. So we want to ask ourselves, how do we democratize this, you know, provide enough access to resources but also ask how we can reduce the computational requirements. You know, can we do energy efficient machine learning now? Can we look at problems at the interface of systems and machine learning? You know, the traditional systems have been designed uh, to have a high amount of redundancy and producing highly accurate computations. But most of machine learning does not require that, right? And that's where by looking at uh, research that 
combine systems and machine learning, you can come up with vastly improved results. And same with uh, data and uh, machine learning together. You know, instead of have passively collecting data before and then doing machine learning, can you look at active data collection processes? You know, how do you strategically collect data in an interactive way and do with much less data, right? When we are interacting with other humans, we are not gonna just ask all the questions, right? If it's interactive, you're gonna change the questions you're gonna ask. And so how can we build these mechanisms also into the data collection process? These are some of the research I look at broadly. And so I think this picture to me uh, sums up how we need to think of the field of you know, all these three components coming together. And in addition, of course, look at how this impacts uh, the deployment, right? Who are the stakeholders once the algorithms are uh, deployed? So, you know, how did the field take off uh, to where it is today? In the last few years, there's been so many exciting progress, right? And uh, as an example task, you know, it started with computer vision and image classification. How do we efficiently classify images at scale? I mean, this is trivial for humans. What makes it challenging for uh, machine learning is the, all the possible variations, right? So you can't just write down a few rules to specify what are the different variations. And that's why the modern deep learning has been vastly successful, because you can't easily specify uh, rules or models uh, to look at all these latent variations. But the source of all this progress is again traced back to data, right? So it's the ImageNet, you know, that has its origin here at Stanford with Dr. Fei-Fei Li, right? That, uh, you know, truly has been uh, uh, the source of progress because for the first time we had these millions of images and also, you know, thousand categories was the biggest number of categories uh, when it was introduced. And, uh, you know, so that's been crucial for us to learn features from data itself. And the question is, what about other areas where we may not have enough data, right? So far, all this progress has been in terms of getting enough uh, data at scale. Uh, but, you know, we also need to be mindful of the biases in which this data has been collected. In fact, there's a recent work by Ben Recht in uh, UC Berkeley that's, uh, you know, the title is, do ImageNet classifiers generalize on ImageNet, right? So you hope the answer is yes, but there's so many nuances there. And all that can be traced back to the bias in, with, in the way the data was collected, in the way it was labeled. You know, I, I can't go into all the details here, but as even kind of a simple intuition, right, if you look at the category of fish, it's not just fish in the natural surroundings, but it's like when human, you know, with the fish, right? When somebody has caught a fish. So you're kind of introducing this contextual bias in the kind of images you collect. And the question you want to ask is, is this what you're going to see in the end application? Or is this bias going to hurt you in many ways, right? And, uh, and so that's something to keep in mind when we are collecting this data at this vast scale what kind of inherent biases does this data have and what is the impact uh, when we release it in the real world? So the data was the first part, the model was the second, right? So this is where the deep learning models with their flexibility was really critical uh, to be able to learn all the features from data. And the third part was the compute and this is where the GPUs have been the key because we've had uh, you know, these uh, enormous compute requirements. In some of the biggest models, you may need more than a billion operations for a single image. And it's the parallelism of GPUs that have enabled this, right? And that's where in the last uh, few years, we've had rapid progress in being able to improve accuracy uh, in especially this ImageNet task, but even more broadly. And so the question is, what's remaining? And as I've kind of said before, I think the aspect of how to improve the data requirements, how to improve the compute requirements are now the next things forward, and how to truly be able to generalize by even having less resources, 
right? So that's kind of where things are at the forefront now. And so my research involves tensors, which, you know, uh, I believe will kind of be at the core of bringing together all the trinity of AI together. So what do I mean by this, right? So tensors are extensions of matrices. As with all the uh, abstract math concepts, docs can be a great way to <laughs> explain them, right? But, you know, so they are extensions of matrices, but why are these extensions so interesting, right? Um, you know, if you think about the data we model, it's uh, almost always multidimensional, right? So image has three dimensions. It's the width, height, and the number of channels. If it's video, it's four dimensions with the time. If it's like multimodal data, if you combine image and text together, it's the product of the two dimensions, right? So, you know, you can have this highly multidimensional data and you want tensors as a more natural encoding of that data. If you try to express these as matrices, you lose that information, right? So tensors are more natural to do that. But it doesn't stop just at, you know, expressing the data, but how do we then compute over this data in interesting ways? And that's where tensors, you know, can not just encode data, but also these higher order moments of data, right? So even if your data is just a vector, if it's a random vector, you know, the matrix is used for pairwise moments. If you want pairwise correlations or covariance matrix, it's uh, two-dimensional. But on the other hand, if you want to, like, now express correlations among a triplet of variables, that's when you start needing this tensor, right? So these are, again, natural ways to incorporate higher-order correlations. And the question is, how do you then compute on them? Right? Because, of course, this is a lot of entries. In fact, it's cubic in the length of the vector. So you don't want to explicitly form these big objects. Right? So the question is, how do you implicitly compute on this and express an algebra uh, with tensors? And that's where, at the core of it, there is uh, the uh, uh, question of what computations can you do with tensors. Right? So with matrices, the underlying core operation is matrix products, right? So you can multiply two matrices, and there are these nice extensions to tensors now. You can multiply a tensor in several different dimensions. You can multiply it with vectors. You can multiply it with matrices. You can even multiply two tensors, right? So we call them tensor contractions. And, you know, I've shown here pictorially what it means, right, if you're now contracting it with two vectors. So now this creates a much richer family of operations than simply just matrix products, right? And same as linear algebra is built on the foundation of matrix products, you can now do the same with tensors. And so you now have this rich universe of operations, and now you can ask, how can I do better machine learning with this? As an example, you know, the question is where, you know, where can I now use tensors in my neural network architectures? Right, so as I said, the image is three-dimensional data you input, right? I mean, if it's also the batch size, it's four dimensions. And now through convolutional layers, you're processing these images. But when it comes to the fully connected layers in these standard networks, you know, we are throwing away all this three-dimensional information, right? So the spatial information is all, like, ignored. You just convert it into a single vector, and you're, you know, learning a weight matrix and so on. So the question is, we are throwing away this information. Can we incorporate it by looking at this richer universe of tensor operations? And that's what we've done in some of the previous works where we said end-to-end -end we can maintain the three-dimensional structure. So now you're learning separable weights on the different dimensions. You're also looking at you know, uh, making these weights load dimensional in a tensorial sense, so like low rank tensors, so you can reduce the number of parameters and you can ask, can I get similar or even better accuracy, right? So now, once you think in terms of these richer set of operations, there is a much bigger class of uh, neural networks you can design with this that can better exploit the dimensionality information. And what we see is you can get uh, nearly the same accuracy 
uh, but reduce the number of parameters by more than 65% in some of these networks, right, in these fully connected layers. So it's possible to be now simultaneously small, so it's less memory requirements, less computational requirements, and still have good accuracy, right? And you are doing this by exploiting the structure in the data, right? There's inherently this spatial structure, and you want to retain it all the way through. So this is one example where structure can reduce these requirements and still give you good accuracy. You can do the same with time series. Uh, you can do the same with like learning these topic models you know, in an unsupervised way, meaning you categorize documents at a huge scale and you don't even have labels of what those topics are. So there are several examples where you can utilize these tensors. And so Tensorly is this open source framework uh, we are developing. Uh, Jean Kosefi is uh, the primary author of this package. And it's a Keras-like package, meaning you, know, you don't need to know the details of the tensor algebra and tensor computations. You can utilize many pre-built uh, tensor layers into your neural network connected to PyTorch, TensorFlow, MXNet, all these backends, but also define your own, right? And it's in Python. And there are all these Jupyter notebooks you can go and uh, really like kind of understand uh, uh, how these things work. So it's possible to now deploy this, and if you want, to go deeper and understand what's going on. So some of the other open source efforts, I think that's really the key to democratizing AI. Right, and I'm very proud of uh, NVIDIA's effort called Rapids that looks at building end-to-end -end workflows where there is GPO acceleration throughout. So if you're a data scientist at a company, most of the time you'll be spending is on data preparation and transformation rather than the actual machine learning. Right? That's where most of the time is spent. And so what at NVIDIA we asked was how we can you know, make that scalable, make it fast, you know, put that on the GPU, but reduce the CPU-GPU communication end-to-end, -end, right? So all the way from creating the data frame to visualization, everything stays in the GPU and can be extremely fast. So Rapids is an Apache open source effort. Uh, there's, in addition to deep learning, all the classical machine learning algorithms, you know, XGBoost, that's the most commonly used algorithm, graph algorithms. So feel free to go and check out, again, the extensive resources available for this. So some of the other things where I look at incorporating structures is in the context of autonomous systems. You know, autonomy is very much in our minds today, right? The mind and the body coming together. But the question is, you know, is it safe enough for the real world? And the honest truth is it's not. <laughs> Right? I would not want to be sitting in a self-driving car today. Right? And if I'm saying that, that means we need to have much more guaranteed safety uh, requirements uh, in these machines. And the question is, what is a good foundation to start there? And at Caltech, we have this center. It's a new center that brings together people from all these different disciplines. And we are asking both the foundational questions as well as how it's making an impact in the real world. The foundational will be now asking how we can combine machine learning principles with control theory, which looks at stability and safety, right? What does it mean for the two to come together? So I'll just finish this with a video which shows like our starting, um, you know, so the neural lander is the lander that used a neural network to learn a better landing. The baseline is just the standard controller. And so you see the neural lander did a much smooth landing compared to the uh, baseline. And so that means there's a lot of potential uh, to do robotics well. And you can do that also you know, with so many NVIDIA packages. There's the Isaac SIM, there is the Drive SIM. And so there's a lot of rich uh, resources to now uh, think about uh, pushing uh, robotics with machine learning and AI to the next level. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you.